Hey, this is Comic Picks by the Glick, and I'm your host, Jason Glick. You know, this week I was looking at, I was at a loss of what to talk about first, because I, one of the comic creators I've always wanted to do a single podcast on is Garth Ennis, and I've really actually gone over like a lot of his signature series in previous podcasts, like Preacher and his run on Punisher. Yeah, but there's one other series he's done, probably one that people like the most, that I haven't talked about yet. This is called Hitman, a series he did um, with um, John, John McCree for 60 issues, plus the sort of um, one-shots and miniseries back in the late 90s, early aughts. Okay, Hitman is the story of Tommy Monahan. He's a super-powered Hitman who's got powers of tel- telepathy and, and X-ray vision. Great things for a Hitman to have so he can look through the door walls to see who's coming to get him and read the minds of people who, who are trying to kill him. Now, what sets him apart from like his other series is that it's set specifically in the DC universe, so which means he can interact with all sorts of intric- people like Batman, Catwoman, and Etrigan the Demon. And but really, it's like it's not uh, all it's not it's but really since Ennis hates superheroes, it's not really about like um, Tommy Monahan's team of the month with whoever who has to be passing through Gotham City where he lives. Um, on a given day, like sure, the opening arc take, um, features um, features Batman, but only because um, like it's it's an ed- I figure it's an editorial driven thing. I mean, he's like he's got his first arc, and you got to have Batman show up so you can because Tommy lives in the Cauldron, the um, Irish part of Gotham City, so he got to have he had to have the Batman um, guest starring role to, sh- to get kick things off and actually kicks on the kicks things off in grand style as as Monahan is hired by some unknown party to kill the Joker for a million bucks. Things don't go well, and that kind of sets the tone for the rest of the series, because, like, what? Well, because well, it's basically about um, Tommy, Tommy realizing that the um, that all the that that the way he, way he does things, like his life of a hitman of killing people, living by the gun, it's no good, and it's it's solely go, it's the, hit, the hitman is just a slow, like, even though it's extremely funny and very clever time, it's a slow, so sometimes depressing descent into the inevitable. Into the inevitable, uh, you know, the destruction, destruction of of a, a person who li- lives, lives and dies by shoot, shooting and killing people for a living. Now that's not now. Of course, what makes a series makes a series work a lot more often than not is that Ennis is knows how to um, craft a really really well on gun gunfight, and McCree knows how to display it. And Ennis also has a great, great, um, dis- disgusting sense of humor in most parts. I mean, I get his. You know, his first encounter with Batman, Monahan just barfs all over his his feet after he after um, Batman like socks him in the gut. And then you also have like other other goofy storylines like like Zombie Night at the Gotham Aquarium, where some where some zombie gas is um you is just to reanimate a bunch bunch of um dead dead sea sea creatures, and you get to see them shoot shooting a bunch of baby seals and penguins in the head for for great comic effect. And and of course, there's also the time when. When um, dinosaurs are unleashed through a time travel de- time travel device um, at Engine Peak, the uh, research lab right outside of Gotham City, it sets the stage for all sorts of great great comic mayhem. And then there's a time that vampires came to Gotham and tried to take over the Cauldron in part of the um, No Man's Land crossover that was run through Batman titles at the time. And it's it's great it's great it's great fun. Then really, it's like the uh, it's all the goofy stuff serves as a counterpoint to all the um, serious stuff, like when. Like when Tommy goes face to face with the um, with world's deadliest hitman Johnny Navarone, and winds up ha- losing one of his best friends in the process, and also the um, uh, and also the time when um, Tommy winds up um, coming face to face with his dad, who he never knew, or the or the slow deaths, the slow and inevitable deaths of all of his friends, and even his well, I'm not gonna say who like the, the major death later on in the series, but it's but that's the thing about. My the reason I don't like Hitman as much as his other stuff. Like for me, it's like if you're gonna buy one Garth Ennis series, it's gotta be Preacher. But between Hitman and Preacher, um, you've read a lot of what um, Ennis already has to say, and like uh, if and like a lot of and a lot of stuff you like I've read of, of Ennis afterwards. I mean, it's taken kind of him repackaging a lot of the stuff, usually to great effect. Other times, you know, just to pay the bills. But with Hitman, though, I mean, Ennis like the, the tone varies. Sharply from from story to story, in, at times. I mean, like, you'll, like I said, you'll get a good goofy story, like with like with the zombie at the Gotham Aquarium. And they'll be followed up with um, something 
like some something later on with um like Tommy going to Ireland to find out a find out about his dad who was just like an utter bastard. I mean, like it just varies wildly. Like the um like the tone just get like the the problems with the tone just get bigger and bigger, greater and greater. Like between the goofy and the serious as the series goes on. My favorite Hitman stories are the ones that just manage to balance humor and comedy. Um, it, um. My favorite Hitman stories are the ones that mention power, balance, humor, and comedy, like um, nat- naturally, like with, um, like with, like the Ace of Killer story, where, where Tommy winds up um, fighting against a, de- a demon from hell that was that, that sent to kill him, and he winds up having a team with with Catwoman and Jason Blood, the human host of the demon, and it's a great, it's great, perfectly, um, perfectly paced escalation of carnage. It basically, ends with everyone trying to holding up in a church. To try and hold off this this demon that's come to get them, and also them trying to make a bargain with Etrigan, which never ever ends well, and also Tommy's Heroes, which basically has um, Tommy and his crew going to the um, fictional country of Tananda to help out um, a group called Third World Aid from a from a country that's been, that's that's ruled by a dictator and is currently fighting a civil war against a drug lord. As they get there, though, they find out that you know the situation trying to choose between who to support a dictator and a drug lord much harder than it seems yeah but overall I mean it's like the series is, is definitely a lot of fun and it's like even like even then even though I, I complain about like it being too serious at times I'm not saying these serious stories are bad they're still really well done but you get the feeling that a lot of that from the, when the series is starting out you want like a lot of like a good like good goofy um over the top over the top action stuff and you, you kind of like you're not really expecting like a lot of the serious stuff to take in, but you know that's just me. It's like I know a lot of other people like it, but for me though, Hitman is always gonna be second to Preacher and Garth Ennis's canon. Yeah, but that's not all of the, the stuff that you did with it because a couple of years later, Manus came back with this with the series for um, a Hitman JLA crossover, and it's that was it's definitely one of the better better stories. I mean, it's not not quite up there with with the best of them, but it's fun because. It basically has um has the parasites that um gave Tommy his powers um coming back um being located on a shuttle and taking it over and then w- them and the shuttle finding its way into um Justice League airspace on the moon, so naturally, and then um the so naturally you get um Tommy come, they, um Batman has to bring Tommy to the Justice League Watchtower to um look to experiment on his, on his um alien parasite dri- um driven blood driven blood to find 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 out what they're up against. Of course, this also draws on a previous issue of Hitman, where Tommy met up with Superman on the top of a roof, and you find out he talked he talked talk to Superman about having about the problems he was having, how Superman failed to save this one guy's life, while he he saved the shuttle, but he he couldn't save the one guy who had fallen between the planks at the time, and it, it was a great that was a great issue, and it plays off that because as just as bat because as Batman is like grilling Green Lantern for teaming up with Tommy in a previous episode, Superman walks on and says, "Hey, Tommy, how you doing?" Mm. And Batman's like. What? He's a killer. How could you? How could you team up with him like that? Uh, and it's it's fun because it's because it plays off against like the more like like the moral um it's like the moral standards of the Justice League versus um versus Tommy Monahan because while the um, parasites um, find a way to telepathically shut off all the superheroes' superpowers, it then falls to like the the one non super superpowered person. Well, because after Batman gets sacked with one of the parasites, to find a way to solve all these problems. Naturally, at least to Tommy killing everything on the, on the on the all the parasites on the satellite and their human hosts, which doesn't sit well with the Justice League at all. But that's that's only part of the story, and it's a good it's a good moral quandary. Even if like I do feel that the the deck is somewhat stacked against against the league from the from the beginning because you know it's like it's ah forget it. Anyway, but it's it's an interesting story because it's because it basically shows you what. Like how talks about how like well the Justice League would have found a way to solve this, uh, that minimal loss of life when it's left to like an ordinary guy with only his guns guns and wits to survive, like he's got to do whatever he can. Yeah. Then you've also got like let's see the uh, Hitman One Million story, which because like Hitman really didn't participate in a lot of DC crossovers because and it's you know I'm not gonna I don't care about like the uh, it's like like all this all this big superhero stuff, but with the One Million crossover, which is um. Mastermind by Grant Morrison. This basically had um, Tommy Monahan being um, taken from the um, 800, 
from our, from the present day into the 853rd century by a bunch of um, goofy fanboys who who have heard the legend of Hitman and are trying to um, siphon off some of his iconic power to um, to try and fuel their superhero dreams. Tommy sets them straight about what it means to be a superhero, and then they um, go and, and then the heroes, then the um, kids or fanboys try to um, find a real hero. They get Etrigan and the Demon instead. Yeah, but. Same of the best for last, though, is the Hitman Lobo crossover. That stupid bastitch. See, that that was a lot of fun because, I mean, I don't know. It's like, I'm not sure what Ennis' thoughts on Lobo are, but, well, I mean, well, not, I'm pre- actually, I'm reading the crossover. I'm pretty sure what his thoughts on Lobo are. I'm just kind of wondering if the um, crossover was editorial de- editorially demanded or if um, Ennis said, hey, you know what? I want to do this. But, in either case, it's a lot of fun because it has Lobo being his truly awful self, wandering into um, to Tommy's bar, and then just make, making an a, making an ass of himself, and getting on on everyone's bad side, and then Tommy just shooting him in the eyes, and then seeing him on this horrible chase all over town. It's it's a great great piece of ex- of carnage, d- illustrated by one of the um, few other artists aside from John McCree to um, tackle tackle Tommy Monahan, um, Doug Monk, who d- does some great. Great de- detailed art with the, with the story, and it has great eye for carnage and gruesomeness. But it's it's great cro- great crossover, and like worth picking up. As is like the second half of the series in general, because only the uh, first 20, 28 issues were reprinted in trade paperback. I'll have to admit that it's a it's a crime that the rest of the series hasn't been reprinted yet. But all I can say is that if you can get the, all the series so far and in, in, collect in trade paperback, collect, um, if you find it somewhere on on eBay or in a store, or Amazon. Go ahead and pick it up. As for the rest of the single issues, gotta hit eBay. Like it's far more efficient than hitting the comic book back comic book shops, hoping to find every single issue afterwards. Okay. And on that note, well, we'll see you next time. Okay. Later's. <laughs>